John Henry Hamlin Mountain. Tell the head of his hammer caught a fire. Can't pick him up on then that I'm down again. One who drank the water before I die, die. One cool drink of water before I die, die. Have you ever been in such a sea of humanity? Yes, and I don't like it. It's, it's, it's too many it's people. It's just incredible. All in a hurry. Yeah, and, and very aggressive. So we're headed to Greenwich today, and Jack has been put in charge of navigating the transportation. How's it going for you, Jack? Terrible. It's what? Terrible. You've got us this far, so far. Yesterday. It was long ago. Janie was lovely, she was the queen of my nights. There in the darkness with the radio the secrets that we share, the mountains that we move, caught like a wildfire out of control. There was nothing left to burn and nothing left to prove. Well, that. And I remember what she said to me. How she swore that it never would end. I remember how she held me oh so tight. I didn't know now what I didn't know then. Can't stop it. We were running against the wind. We were young and strong. We were running against the wind. You see what we are now? No, I don't. You've done a few things that you were doing. No. Why are you going to do this? Then we're going to do some double break punch for a minute. No, it's like, that's the double. So after three days in London, it's pretty pretty busy in there. Look. Oh, the market. You want to go to the? We'll come back to that. Okay. We're uh, we're out. We're headed out to Greenwich, and I'm a big fan of uh, British naval history. If you haven't read the Master and Commander series of books, they're some of the best historical fiction books I've ever read. I think I've read them all two or three times. And we're heading out to the was it the Royal Naval Museum? Yes, and the observatory. So. And the Cuddy Stark. So. All kinds of things. A lot nicer, slower pace out here. We can keep up. <laughs> we can we can keep up. This is so fascinating. Can't you just picture a young Jack Aubrey heading down here <laughs> for his formal Navy training? Yes. Yes. The woodwork and the furniture designs here are just so beautiful. So much detail and craftsmanship I just marvel at it it's so old and how many people have sat in these chairs look at the way they were made just beautiful I really like the silver chandeliers on the or they wouldn't be called chandeliers the lamps on the tables candelabras thank you so this grand building would have been the cafeteria for the the Naval College students. This, is, this does not look like any cafeteria I've been to. No, it doesn't. It, uh, you know, I mean, all of this would just, if you went through this, it would inspire you to be as good as you could be. Now, I mean, there's just such a sense of majesty to it and scale. What do you suppose that's for? Hygrograph, thermal hygrograph? And again, is it true that the story goes that he has his hand that went like that and his hand forward, even as if asking for more? 
So I just learned that all of the oak used in making these tables was all came from old ships or materials that were reclaimed from the shipyards. So this is really clever. So they have these push around trolley carts here with mirrors in the top so you can enjoy the frescoes without straining yourself <laughs> or your neck. Isn't that great? I just can't get enough of this cool stuff. It's so beautiful. Everything made by hand, Jack. Look at the, imagine the size of the key that would go in there. So we're heading up to the chapel. One of my favorite historical figures has always been Horatio Nelson. There's a museum here dedicated, or a portion of the museum dedicated to his artifacts. These are the actual stockings that he wore when he was wound, mortally wounded at the Battle of Trafalgar. Here are his breeches, breeches, and the cut where the surgeon cut his pants, assessing his injuries. You can see the hole that was created by the musket ball. So this is the gun that was uh, carried in the, by the fic fictitious character uh, in Sharps series, um, the Irishman, what was his name? Patrick. This, is, this would have been Patrick's gun from the Sharps book series. So this is the Prime Meridian. Now, yeah, right there, east longitude and west longitude. So I'm standing on two hemispheres. You want to stand on two hemispheres together? How about that? You take me around the world, baby. Well, yeah. The prime meridian starts. I don't see the I don't see the metric system here, Jack. So that is something to see. I've read about this in so many books. The time ball. This was uh, this is at the this is uh, the observatory here is pretty high. What's the altitude up here? Um, I don't know. Highest point in London for I guess the highest point, and that ball would drop at one o'clock, I believe. Is that right? Well, precisely at 1 p.m. daily, so the city could synchronize its clocks. So everyone could synchronize their clocks or watches to it. It still rises at 12.55 p.m. and drops five minutes later. And they put it up here, and it's so people could see it from a long ways off, huh? Jack, we have to sneak through the gate before the rosers come. Oh, hi, you never gotten through. <laughs> Country folk fun. Oh, city. Mama, you and your homespun. How about so? This is the this is where the I, I'm assuming this is where the t telescope would have been up there in that dome. Looks like it has kind of a retractable deal going on. My goodness, the architecture here is just I've never seen anything like we just don't have anything like this. I mean, when you go to a pub that says established in 17 or 1677 and it's still open, it's it's hard to put put that into words what that's like. We were at the National Naval Museum and we were in the kids section where you get to play with everything and touch it and everything and there was, you know, what, um, uh, the wheels. Ship's wheel. Ship's yeah. wheel that's, you know, from the 1700s and for us that would be the museum but here it's it's in the kids section so that everyone can yeah, hold on so to it and play. Yeah, just so everyone can grab onto it. The yeah, kids can tear it Lots up. of things from back then. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. great. So we see lots of statues that have been donated from different countries <laughs> and we were having this conversation. I wonder if, if uh, like, Canada sends Britain a statue and like... Oh, here's the statue for you, and then thinking, oh, we gotta find a place to put that thing, and we don't, if we don't put it someplace nice, they're gonna be offended. How, how much of that goes on? Probably a lot. And then they'll be like, we don't like those guys at the Royal Observatory. Let's let's send it in there. They can have it. It's like, like, this is a poet. Like, what's he doing here? It's like giving someone a gift and then expecting them to place it on their dining room table for the next 50 years. So this is a statue of Yuri Gagarin, and he was the first cosmonaut, first human into space, Russian. This was presented here on the 50th anniversary of his um, exploration into what, space. What I thought was so fascinating was he was a steel worker. Yeah, he was an apprentice steel worker in the town where the original of this was made, um, presented by the town, and where the steel is from. 
Fascinating. So back in the day, you could become a you could be an apprentice steel worker and become a cosmonaut. Can you do it today? It crossed the whole place. It's hard because I've noticed that everybody is right here in front of it. So it's not only America that uses the blue tarp That's right. to cover their garden shed. <laughs> I have proof. Hey, look at this pensive little British lad. Oi, what are you talking about? Oh, we have a cockney on our hands. <laughs> what? Oi, Nigel, where's the best chippy in town? Oh, I don't know. Why are you asking me? Go ask him. Oh, so now you're the crocodile hunter. Oh, what? <laughs> we have to work on your accent. <laughs> Nigel. Oh. <laughs> well, I always had a little bit of Austrian blood in me anyway. So I just learned a valuable bit of info about the metric system. And who's to blame for it? Do you know? The French. It's the French's fault. French is responsible for the metric system. France. Well, so they're, they're not responsible for the metric system. They are. They uh, tried to convince the British that they must be part of the metric system, and the British were slow to concede. So, and what? So, th it was an interesting story we learned from a gentleman that works here. Uh, is that uh, when they were trying, when the countries were coming together to try to deter determine where the prime meridian would originate from, could have been anywhere. It came down to there were twenty-six four, countries that ca came together. Came down to four, which was uh, Great Britain. France, Germany, and, and America. And the ca Canadians suggested, they were there as well, uh, that it would be Britain because that was what most people were using. And everyone voted for it except for two countries. I think Brazil maybe was one who just, and, and they, did, they just didn't care. Br Brill was, Brazil was agnostic about it, but the French said, no, we won't do it unless you give us some concessions. And that is that you need to convert to the metric system. And the gentleman who was British said, we British are a bit slow, and he <laughs> chuckled. <laughs> right. I wish you could have been there, but that was, it was fabulous. So it's France's fault. Why? That the British are slow? No, that it was the metric system. Well, I don't, I don't see the correlation. I don't see a lot of metric system around here. But so what has that got to do with the, the British not taking it on? Well, somebody's got to be to blame. Why not the French? <laughs> He's bad. He's bad. Don't follow his logic.